So I'm going to give you a, a little bit of background about how I sort of became involved uh, with the military, and also to try to emphasize how important the collaboration is between the civilian and the military in, in terms of, of uh, what we've learned and how we can share. It's very important, I think, what Dr. DeBehe um, reminded us of after World War II, that when the wars wind down, we tend to forget what we've learned. And you'll notice my whole theme today is how to preserve what we've learned over the last 15 years, where there's been remarkable changes in the way we manage trauma patients, and we don't want to lose either the structure or those lessons that we've learned. So on a personal note, uh, at one time when we, this is way, all of you who are residents now will say, oh, ultrasound's been around for a long time for surgeons, but actually that's not true. There was a lot of pushback when we wanted to learn ultrasound primarily from the radiologists, and I hope there aren't any in this room right now. Um, but we got, every time I would take my little ultrasound machine out of my office, my dean would get called. I mean, it was pretty nasty. Um, and Dr. Pate will remember this back from San Francisco General Hospital. And so we thought maybe the best way to, to diffuse that kind of tension is to be sure that we taught surgeons the correct way to use ultrasound and to emphasize that we were just using it for a diagnostic test of a, uh, answer a certain question, so a directed ultrasound or focused. And in order to do that, we went to the American College of Surgeons and let's say, we're going to develop a course, we're going to teach people how to use it for, um, in a safe way and, and to, to tell them what they can and can't do with it. So I happen to be the chair of the education part of the National Ultrasound Faculty in the uh, early 2000, and we had a representative from the military, he was actually Army, from Yushu's um, Medical Center, Dr. David Weary, and he called me one day and he said, I want you to go up to Travis Air Base and teach ultrasound there, and I'm like, why do I want to do that? I mean, I don't have any connections with the military, and why would I really want to go all that way? So I was a little bit bitchy, I mean, I'll say this, and I do drive a fast car. Um, but it's still a two-hour drive for me to drive from San Francisco to um, Travis Air Base, and I got in my little Porsche and I drove, and I get to the Air Base and they won't let me on the base. And I'm like, why not? And they said, well, where's your tags? What do you have? Who are you? And I said, is it my car? He said, no, 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 it's not your car. We just don't know who you are. So that was my introduction to the military. I had no idea. So finally they came and got me, and I was a little late for the course, and they said, you know, just get in that elevator. So I get in the elevator, and there's two guys from the Navy, and they look at me, and they said, Dr. Knutson, and I said, yes. They said, where's your toga? I said, what are you talking about? Well, it, it does turn out that I did give a lecture on ultrasound once in a toga. Um, this, was in, <laughs> this was in Caesar's Palace in Las Vegas, and a lot of things you can do there, and th something should have just left, been left there, I guess. Um, but I was debating on the virtues of ultrasound versus DPL at that time. And, uh, you know, if you can't say anything good, you can just have to look like you play the role. Anyway, I got to know those guys really well, and I realized that they were going to be deployed the next week. So it was really important for them to learn how to do ultrasound. Well, that's how I got to Germany the first time. In 2004, I went with Dr. Weary to teach ultrasound to, the, to many of the people in the Army who were at the Lonsdul Air Base, or Lonsdul um, Army Base at the time. The Lonsdul, it has both Air Force and Army. The um, air base is about two miles away at Ramstein. Um, and so you can see we had these little tiny sonocytes. These probably look ancient uh, to those of you in the room, but these were the first um, sonocytes that were made, and they were made for spec. They were made so that you could throw them across the room or in a tank, and they wouldn't break. So this was the class that we taught uh, with Dr. Weary in the, in the suit there. Um, and this was my first introduction to Germany. And we were fascinated when we went to the hospital, and at that time, the hospital was very small. It was kind of a little cottage hospital. They had a very limited operating room. They had very, very limited ICU capabilities at that time. And we were listening in to what was happening uh, downrange. And we were hearing these um, terrible injuries that were being inflicted at that time. Most of them were gunshot wounds. It was before the, a lot of IEDs were used. And we would hear these horrible injuries. And the guys that were down there were quite junior. And we were listening and saying, I wonder if there's a way that we could somehow help out. 
So this is my second uh, sort of association uh, with the military. This was a child who picked up an IED, and you can sort of see what happened to him. He lost an eye, he lost an arm. Um, his brother died. Uh, he was sitting next to him when this happened. And his father was told to take this kid home and let him die because the, you know, there was no way to treat a child like this in Iraq. And the father was so distraught, he had just lost one of his sons. And so he took this son to the Air Force, Air Force base in a place called Talil. And the Air Force uh, surgeons were you know, real sympathetic uh, to this uh, little boy and took him in and tried to see what they could do with this open abdomen and all of his other injuries. And I was at this Committee on Trauma meetings at the time in Chicago, and I got a, an email that said, what would you do with this open abdomen like this? I said, well, we just put a wound vac on it and you know, wash it out every so often. And, and, he, and the surgeon said, well, we don't have a wound vac. You know, that's not anything we have in Iraq. Uh, we have no access to it. And um, so I had some friends at KCI. Um, turns out KCI, for those of you who would like to know the history, the person who invented the wound vac is a plastic surgeon who was at the University of Michigan at the same time that I was a medical student there. And the reason he invented the wound vac was because he had to go and debride a lot of the cubidi in people who had spinal cord injuries. And Michigan was a big spinal cord center. And he said, I don't want to do this every night. So he invented this little dressing and then became ultra uber rich, as you know, and probably has not really had to work as a plastic surgeon ever. Um, so I called up KCI and I said, you know, is there any way that we could send over some equipment? And you know, they go, well, I don't know, we'll take it to our corporate. And pretty soon I got a tracking number in my email. It was a tracking number for DSL. And there was something going from London down and then it went to Saudi Arabia and then eventually it landed in Baghdad. And I, then it said private vehicle after that, and I go, oh, you know, I wonder what happened to that. And then about a week later, I got another email from this surgeon, and he said, okay, somebody just pulled up in a truck, and at that time, the hospital was a tent, and he said, just pulled up outside the tent, and he unloaded all this stuff. There's a, there's a machine, there's all this materials, and I go, yeah, that's the wind back. He goes, I wonder how you put it on. So we had to go through you know, how to do this. And those of you who have been to Plug will know that the wound vacs are ubiquitous now in, all, in the, everywhere. They're everywhere um, in both um, Iraq and Afghanistan. So this was the little boy. We were able to get him into Children's Hospital in Oakland. Um, the Air Force flew him into Travis Air Base, and we took care of him at Oakland Children's Hospital. Um, this is uh, Jim Betts, the gentleman in the scrubs, who was the chief of surgery there. And some of you may know Jay Johanneman, who was the surgeon who was actually asking me for the wound back, and the kid's father. Um, and he actually, um, his story won a Pulitzer Prize um, by one of the reporters at the San Francisco Chronicle. And this kid just graduated from high school in Oakland. So it's a great story. So that was my second sort of interaction uh, with the military. And about that same time, we had some incredible leaders, both in, within the military and within the civilian world, who were very interested in somehow partnering up so that we could provide a little bit of help to our multiply deployed people who we saw going and going and going back, back and forth to Iraq and then Afghanistan. So, so Jay and John Holcomb, who's Army, and Jay being Air Force, approached Wayne Meredith, who was then, at that time the president of, the, of our major uh, association, the AAST, and Bill Schwab, I'm sorry, Bill Schwab was the AAST and Wayne was the ACS, and all these people in leadership, and they came in and said, is there any way we could figure out how the civilian surgeons could somehow help out? And so they agreed that we could go as far as Germany, and that we would set up a program where we would bring in some of what, what they called the senior surgeons, I kind of didn't like that term. I said, how about experienced or smart? And they said, no, you have to be senior surgeon to be part of the program. But we were able to send over people on a routine basis. They were all volunteered. Nobody was paid to go. They did support our travel, and they let us stay on the base for free. Um, but everything else was volunteer. And over the course of several years, seven to be exact, we sent 200 surgeons over there, volunteer um, civilian surgeons. The purpose was to, to provide whatever assistance we could um, to mentor some of the more junior military surgeons as they came back to the states, to provide some leadership in trauma center development, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, um, to, to 
to really kind of foster some of the uh, scientific investigations, which are more difficult to do when you're actually deployed downrange, but a little bit easier to do in Lonsdale. <clears throat> and then to begin the retention process of who's going to house this great trauma system once it's, once it's been done. So this is what Lonsdale looks like if any of you have uh, had the opportunity to be there. They've completely rebuilt the hospital uh, as it became a trauma center, and it's quite modern and, and very functional. And our rotations were two to four weeks. I had the opportunity of going there every year for seven um, to work with various uh, surgeons, and it, it was a remarkable experience for us. Um, we took a call with them. We, we did cases with them. Um, we worked alongside and sometimes provided some relief, but I think mostly uh, we learned from them rather than them li living for us. For those of you who have not been in the military, and, and I apologize for those of you that know this already, but it's important to understand the system. And it, for civilians, it, it took us a while to figure this out. And you'll notice that everything is just completely the opposite of the way we think. So a level one center in the United States is you know, here, or San Francisco General has everything. And in, in the military, it's just the opposite. So a level one is just your battalion aid station, it might just be a medic, maybe a nurse. And then there's the far forward surgical team where you go, a Kazovac being a helicopter. Um, and this is, the, this is important to remember this step because I'm gonna get back to that in a minute. Then, then there's a combat support hospital, so Baghdad or Bastion or Balad. Um, and then after that, it's, it's the uh, air evac, so the fixed wing, and level four would be launch stool, and then level five is in the United States. So this is the system. It was remarkably set up by, by smart people like, like Jeff over here uh, and Jay and John, some very um, experienced people who had were in the military but had had civilian trauma experience, and I think that's really important to remember. And all this was tied together by, a tr by an incredible um, system of keeping track. Uh, we're, we're right now looking at this, uh, the registry, the, what's called the daughter now, the Department of Defense Trauma Registry, and the, and the video conferences, which happened every week, are still going on. And in those, in those video conferences, you would learn about who took care of that patient first, and then second and third, and it was a remarkable m and M, if you can even imagine that. And this is what it looked like. You, you obviously can't see people downrange, but you can see people from all over when they're participating in this conference. And it's when you think about a trauma registry that has to be maintained across three different continents, I mean, really, it's an amazing, amazing system. And many things I think we could take back into the States, and I'll talk a little bit more about that when I talk about uh, my role at the college. Um, initially, we had limited, or you, you guys had limited, a way to speak about what was going on, and sometimes you would get people who, who had their, their, uh, their operation note on their dressing. So this one has three segments, small ball, and Hartman's been done. Um, the staff at Lonstool was all purple, meaning that you, couldn't, you didn't know who was Army, Air, Air Force, uh, or Navy. Everybody worked together very well. Um, and the people that, the patients that we got when we were there were about 36 to 48 hours after their injury, may have had one or two operations already. Everybody got a washout when they got to Lonstool, assuming that everybody was already contaminated. And our job, which was an interesting job when you think about it, and especially for the residents in the room, you, you know, you had a, a, a guy who was involved in a motorcycle accident last night. He had a small, a mesenteric injury and a diaphragm injury. You know what happened to him, you follow him through, you send him home. And here, you've had two different surgeons operating on this patient by the time you got them. They were the sickest people you will ever see because of the multiple injuries, and your job was to get them ready to transport out as soon as you could because you were getting ready to, to, for the next group. So it wasn't unusual to have five criticals come in all at once, and everybody divided up and took care of these people, and your job was to be sure that they were ready to fly. So what does that mean? It says, well, the hematocrit had to be a certain level. They had to have uh, their, uh, their, their uh, potassium had to be perfect because you, know, be, you were going to be lost uh, to that patient for 12 hours when they're in flight coming back to the United States. It's a very different way of thinking. And I can remember as an intern how I was so, you know, I knew every, everybody's magnesium level and all those things, that details that you had to know. It's, it, it's the same as an old attending. All of a sudden, you, this was really important to know everything about that patient before they left. So it was, a, for us, a very interesting experience. 
And of course, the injuries that we were seeing there were just devastating, multi-cavity when it was uh, penetrating and severe, terrible blast, and multiple burn injuries at the beginning. And I know you have a burn center here. Um, when we got some of these, these terrible burn injuries, we had the people from San Antonio would come over and help us. So if there was more than 50% of burn, we, they came over to help us. I learned a tremendous amount about how to resuscitate a burn, major, major burn. Um, this was the frag jar. These were some of the things, uh, this came from Balad. Uh, some of the things were taken out of our, our injured troops uh, by uh, explosions. So these were things that were in, embedded into body cavities uh, that were removed. It was really, for us, a, a very interesting experience. I took the burn sheets back with me to San Francisco General. I thought they were, it was remarkable how well they did with burn injuries um, and had an opportunity to visit the burn center uh, in San Antonio after I came back. You can imagine, though, think about it again for the residents here, how you, you do a resuscitation on the burn and you have to keep track, right, of the urine output and how much fluid. Imagine having to do that with the patient that's traveling and how precise you have to be with, with what you record. Um, and this was the, um, the critical carrier transport. Um, this is, believe it or not, there's a patient under all this. Those of you that haven't had an opportunity to see what a CCAT looks like, it's a remarkable what, what they can load up and take, the ventilator, uh, all the chest tubes, everything getting ready to fly. Uh, some, some of you will recognize Dr. Trunke here helping to load one of the uh, patients. Uh, you know, it's sort of a, amazing to me that with all the money that goes into the military, the way they get from Lonstool Hospital to the air base at Ramstein is in a bus. You know, this little bus, a school bus. I'm like, geez, you know, after all these things you can do, we can't do better than a school bus, but that's what we had. And we did whatever we could. We helped load people. Um, I wanted to be a CCAT doctor. I, I thought, boy, I really want to get a chance to fly. You can see it's not quite the right size uniform for me, but they finally did let me uh, take a trip with them. Um, so there, here we are getting ready with the CCAT team. So there's a, always a physician uh, and a nurse and an RT for each patient. And they, have, they can take up to three to four intubated patients on, with each team. And they must carry enough equipment for 48 hours in case something happens to the flight. So they get diverted or something breaks down. So they have to take all their, all their medications, nutrition. We didn't stop nutrition. We kept people on GI feeds the whole time. Um, all their medications, everything has to be f uh, flown with them. So this is the plane that, that the Air Force uses um, for their, their critical care air transport. I, I, I just can't believe we don't use these in the States because it's remarkable um, what they can do. And this is the, what is called the flight line uh, when you go over to the air base. And when I went over there, they told me, doctor, just stay out of the way. I said, okay, you know, because <laughs> we, we know how to do this. So they get the, the bus comes up to the back. They empty these enormous planes out, which are used to take tanks in and all that other stuff. They empty them completely and they start loading patients. The, the most critical ones go in the back. This is what the plane looks like in the inside. You can see where all these um, bunks have been placed and there's, um, there are patients on the side if they're walking wounded and then the bunks and then eventually the, um, the most critical ones are brought in uh, in the back of the plane, the, first, the last in and the first out. And this is my patient that I had taken care of and operated on, and they let me travel with him back um, to uh, Walter Reed Hospital. And you can barely see the patient. And you have to remember these flights are cold and loud. You can't hear anything up there, so everything is visual. So every, all the clues are visual. If your patient's having trouble, you'll see a visual clue. You won't hear anything. And this is just to give you an idea of how big these, uh, these planes are. This uh, gentleman who's sitting I don't have a pointer, but the gentleman who's sitting there with the um, closest to you is the patient's doctor. Next to it is the patient's wife. Uh, the parent, you can see the, the respiratory tech is down there. And I'm in the back just kind of watching to see. And, and you can see all the medications that are hung on that back wall. That's medications for this particular patient. And then they have these chairs that you sit in, and then they move them up close to the patient so that you can touch and see. Um, so you're sitting right next to it the whole time because you won't hear very much. Now they were t trying to tell me what to do if the plane had a problem and how I was supposed to get evacuated out of there. And I said, I don't want to know. I'm just going to sit here and you know try to hold on. Well, 
I was so fortunate to be able to be at Lonstool multiple times and to fly with the CCAT teams, and I, I just really wanted to see it fresh. I said, you know, you guys have just done a remarkable job. I really want to, to see if I can go downrange. And they said, no, it's just not going to happen. We don't take civilians. It's too dangerous, and we can't be your, your liability for us. You don't know what to do if something happens. And so, you know, I sort of gave up on the idea. And uh, w I was at home after coming back from a meeting, and my cell phone went off, and I answered it, and it was some person from CENTCOM, so it was, I, I said, um, okay, and he said, you know, we, we want you to come talk at this trauma conference, and, you know, it, it's going to be blah, 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 and he's going on, okay, okay. I finally was about to hang up. He said, where is this conference? He said, oh, it's in Balad. And I'm like, I'm going to Iraq? And I, so I hung up the phone, and I go, nah, that didn't really happen. He said, you know, don't get your hopes up. The, these things don't always work, and I, I said, okay. I waited, and um, my husband and I were had gone to uh, the, the ski meeting up in Tahoe, and and all of the time I'm there, things are coming through like she's gonna bullet, right? Whatever is that? He said billet. Where you could stay here, and you're gonna go to Travis and get your, you know. And I'm like, this is really gonna happen. So finally, we're driving home, and and I I haven't told my husband yet. Right? <laughs> He's like, so I I said to him, um, guess where I'm going next month? He goes, I don't know where. I says. I'm going to Iraq, and he stopped the car in the freeway. <laughs> he said, you're going where? And then he said, well, you know, they probably wouldn't let you go if it weren't safe. And indeed, I did get a chance to go, and you can see the group that, I, that uh, was assembled there. We did give a trauma conference there. It was called the Trauma Chief Conference, so all the deployed surgeons who were there came to the conference, including a couple Iraqi surgeons, which they were very brave to come on base. And this was in March of 2008. I, I scrubbed on every case that I could and really tried to learn everything. I, I was telling Jeff last night, I learned how to put it, that's why I learned how to do a vascular shunt, because um, they did a lot of them there, and we just never had used that technology. Um, when, the, when we landed there, it was Easter Sunday, um, and I, you know, again, being very green and not exactly know what was, what was going on. They, they came to get me, they rushed to get me, they said, you have to come and see what's happening. And I go, what is it? And we're running a resuscitation with the tank machine. I said, what the hell is that? They said, oh, it's great, it'll tell you if you need, you know, how much uh, product you need and when you need it and when you give plates. They go, wow, that's a great idea. And of course, now we all use TIG. But that's where I learned about it. This is what um, Balad looked like when I got there. Uh, nicely um, Kevlar, uh, so it wasn't the old tents that they used to have. And this was the home of the Tuskegee Airmen. Um, a few, some of these Tuskegee Airmen were at the inauguration uh, of President Obama, if you, if you looked hard. Um, they were, the, the surgeons were not allowed to be with, uh, with the white pilots at the time during World War II, and they flew out of this base and they did more air rescues than any, uh, any particular um, other group. And this was Dr. Er, Dr. Dick Cheney's trailer, which is where they put me. And he wasn't there, don't worry. Um, but <laughs> this is the, supposed to be the safest trailer on the base. And of course, it's right next to the airfield. So all night long, it was people going out. You could hear the air. And it literally mortared all the time. I'm sure you know that, Jeff. It was, you just hear it all night, and the sirens go off, and you just have to kind of um, grit your teeth. There was a whole bank of stuff when I walked in there, and, and they, they said, don't touch any of that, because that's World War III, if you, if you touch any of those things. And I said, OK, all I wanted was a shower and a bathroom. I did not want to have to run out in the desert to go to the bathroom at night. So that's why I was very lucky to have a trailer. And the surgeons there were, you know, you know, fun, Could, took their job very seriously. This was the receiving area. This will look familiar to many of you. Um, you can see this. Uh, this is Jeff Davison, who was actually from Michigan, going out to, to meet this helicopter. And, and on uh, this place where it, it says the hero's uh, way, as they, as they come through, there's a, there's a flag on the roof, so they know that they're in American hands uh, when they see that flag. And these were the transport gurneys, which were quite um, ubiquitous, but they were also really helpful because you didn't have to take the patient off of them, and they could just keep going right through the emergency room and into the operating room on these things before they ever came off. But why am I telling you all this? Well, this was, this was a mass cast. This was what it looked like. And it, initially, you think, this is, a, this is a mess. And actually, this is the most organized system that, that you can imagine. Everybody had a medic. 
Um, everybody had a doctor, everybody had an ultrasound, and the labs were drawn, and then it was like, who needs to go to the OR, who needs to go to CT? It was so organized, and I sat back and watched this, and this is important because this is where I learned, and, and I'll show you what, you know, my experience with, uh, with disasters in a minute, but th I, I remembered this, and it was very important to me uh, when it was my turn to be in charge. So this, in Balad, there were um, four operating rooms. You could do two patients each. And you can see here, I'm scrubbed with the neurosurgeon. They're letting me put in a, a little uh, intracranial uh, pressure monitor, which is spooky in itself for me to be doing it. But we did whatever we could to help out um, when, w in, in the mass cast. And you can see I kind of got into the whole thing, except I didn't do the haircut. I just couldn't do the haircut. This is Don Jenkins on, the, on, the, uh, on my uh, right side. Uh, who was my escort. Um, he came from uh, Wolford Hall, so Jeff knows him really well. Um, an incredible leader in trauma, has been the president uh, recently of the Eastern Association for Surgery of Trauma. And then uh, next to me on the other side is Todd Rasmussen, who's an incredible vascular surgeon who's now in charge of combat casualty care research uh, in uh, Fort Detrick, Maryland. And this is what I, I really... Um, you know, I have to say that this was an incredible M&M, &M, and we called it Operating Room 5, and it was on the roof uh, of the hospital, and this is what the view was from up there. But people would go up there and talk about what happened, and I was there during, unfortunately, during a, a death of one of the, uh, one of the military, um, and it was, everybody sat up on the roof and talked about what they could have done better, and, you know, kind of expressed their feelings. It was the most genuine M&M &M I think I've ever participated in. So um, you have to remember again, so we don't forget that this this has been the most incredible um, care that have ever has ever been recorded in the la in war. We in you can see here that um, the case fatality rate or um, all these things that have killed in action, died of wounds, case fatality rate has been going down steadily despite the fact that the uh, ISS or the injury severity score has gone up. So the more severe injuries and yet the, n the number of people who have been saved has been remarkable. But you can also see that it didn't start low. It actually started ab ab above 20% and has gradually gone down to less than 9%. But we don't want the next conflict to have to learn over. We don't want to start high. So this is clearly the maturation of the surgeons and their experience and maturation of the system. Um, and we don't want to lose that. And there, you know, there's been an incredible science that has gone into this. You know, the Journal of Trauma every uh, year has had a dedicated combat casualty care. And we have taken those lessons um, back to the states and, and have used a lot of it in our own trauma center. This is from uh, Lauren Blackburn, who just showed kind of the progression of what's been learned um, over the years. And you'll recognize a lot of this, so I'm not going to dwell on it. But you know, the ratios of uh, blood products and the eventually platelets, FFP, showing that the you know the old way we used to do it, which was give one FFP after four units of blood, was really wrong. And you can preserve the, the number of units you have to give by giving the, the, plate, the platelets and the fresh frozen plasma early so the patients don't bleed. And there was, this was a remarkable um, you know, observation during the war. I mean, think about it. Think about trying to do this in the middle of a, a Balad or Bagram or wherever you happen to be. Um, and this is the, what was called damage control resuscitation, including using factor seven and TXA. And remember that when, you, when you're in, in a deployed situation, your blood bank's not exactly, you know, um, one that, can, that you can't, can you replace all the time. So you have to be very careful with your blood products. And I'm gonna show you how this was important to us in our own disaster in San Francisco. And the tourniquet. Um, we used to think a tourniquet was for wimpy surgeons, you know, it should be able to get control of that vessel. Well, that's truly not, not correct. I mean, many, many lives have been saved with the tourniquet, and we were afraid that, the, you know, the, that they would go away like the mass suit did, which we used to use. But we've now put tourniquets on our ambulances in San Francisco. Sometimes they're put on a little bit aggressively. I had one come on with a, a little person, a person who had a pinky injury and had a tourniquet on. I go, well, it's probably a little bit of an overkill, but I'd rather that they use it uh, than not. 
Um, I, this is one of my cases uh, after I came back. There was a gunshot wound to the knee um, at San Francisco General Hospital. And I, I will um, just say right now that uh, San Francisco General Hospital is, is dying. It's no longer going to be called the San Francisco General Hospital. In May, we're moving into a new facility, which is right, across, right next to us, and it's now called Facebook. Because, because the money came from the Zuckerberg, so it's actually called the Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg's uh, San Francisco Hospital or something like that. So, so thank you all you Facebook users for building me a new hospital. So I had one of these gunshot wounds, and we knew that ortho was going to do their big ortho-rama. And then like, so, so I said, you know what, let's just put in a shunt, and then we'll just let them do their thing, and then we'll come back. And we certainly did a little PD feeding, too, but I learned to get it uh, from that Todd Rasmussen's taught me how to do. And I went and took a nap, you know, where they were doing their ortho, and it was the middle of the night. And then we woke up fresh, and we came back and did our anastomosis. Um, I also had a chance to visit the Palo Alto uh, Veterans Hospital, where a, one of the polytrauma centers, to meet some of these guys that had just been um, had just come back and were getting their rehab, um, and saw the remarkable things that could be done for the the, the double amputees and sometimes triple amputees. Um, this was a young guy who was a Marine who had gone to high school with my kids. Um, and I went to visit him uh, and learn about what they did. So this was the um, summary of the surgeon visiting uh, program where we, as I mentioned, 200 uh, surgeons have participated. They were both trauma or vascular surgeons. Uh, we did publish in the New England Journal uh, some of the results of our, of our exchange and we were able to get Lonstool verified by the college as a level one trauma center. So, a great success, I think, of the program. Lots of uh, collaborative papers that were published. Uh, this is Warren Dorlack, uh, and um, uh, I'm trying to remember. Ray Fang from the, from the Air Force, who were both over at Lonstool at one time. Um, and then th certainly the prompt and proper studies that came out, which are being done in the States, which have just finished finally, about transfusion. And I think, Dr. Pate, you were there when we started uh, to collect the data on how we were doing transfusions. Um, that was a $50 million um, uh, research project that was funded by the Department of Defense in, in 22 civilian hospitals. And then the National Trauma Institute, which I'm proud to be a member of, is also funded by primarily from the DOD. Well, where do we go now? Um, how do we sustain this uh, military-civilian collaboration uh, that happened um, so nicely during this time? Well, I just wanted to remind you about some of the uh, events that have happened. Um, in the, uh, the board there is, is, came from Balad. That was how they kept track of their casualties and what was happening during multi-casualties. On the bottom, you recognize Boston, where tourniquets were used quite frequently, and the, and the damage control um, resuscitation, as well as how you treated the uh, amputations, was really learned from the military. Up on the, far, on the right is my time in Haiti, which I'll talk to you a little bit about. And then on the bottom was my own personal disaster um, in San Francisco, not me personally, but the one I was involved with. So in, in Haiti, there were um, over 300,000 injuries and 200,000 deaths uh, when that, when that uh, uh, earthquake happened. And we have a, a program at the college called Operation Giving Back. Uh, many of you might know about this, and uh, being registered with OGB, I was uh, able to get a, a little berth on the Comfort, which is the Navy ship going out of Nor uh, uh, Northfolk um, in Virginia, and the Comfort went down uh, to provide some aid uh, to Haiti. Um, so this was uh, the Operation Unified Response. Um, this is the uh, inside of the uh, ship. It has 11 operating rooms. You can see they're pretty nicely equipped. There's 1,000 beds on that ship. Um, this is sort of an interesting idea, though. This is, these are the things that keep, the, keep the, uh, the, the gurney in place while you're operating with the ships moving, so that was quite an experience. I can tell you, for me, um, I was operating, and I do, we did a lot of burn and, and, uh, and uh, plastic surgery work um, it, when we were there. And, and I was wearing loops, um, and, and I think I'm a decent surgeon. I'm a, probably not the best, but you know, spent a lot of years doing it. And I, I couldn't find my suture. I would be looking down, and, and then I would be like, what? 
And I, I finally, the guy said, take those loops off because the, the, the ship moves, right? So every time you, you're looking in a small field and it's, you know, the, the field has moved out of your vision. So once I got rid of the loops, I was sort of back to normal. It was an interesting experience being, with the, being on this uh, ship while, while it was moving. Um, this, they had a beautiful ICU, you can see here, and this was Casabac, which is their emergency department. Um, in the time that, that I was on the Comfort, this is how many admissions there were, many of them children, because Haiti, most of the Haitian population is less than 18. Um, 800 operations performed in three weeks, and I have to say most of this was orthopedic work. They did a phenomenal job. They would operate 24-7. All of it, again, volunteer. We had some burns, and we even had some uh, babies born on the uh, ship. You can see this one. The, you can see the, the fracture of the mom's pelvis uh, and her femur there, uh, yet the baby and the mother both survived. Now, this looks like a, a tent that could be anywhere, right? It could be in Balad, it could be in Afghanistan, and uh, it was in Haiti. Um, and then I had a chance to eat MREs, right, the, the military meals. And I, I would say that if you have a choice, the Air Forces are the best. Armies are really bad. <laughs> there you go, guys. And then there's a, there's a little military humor everywhere you go. They are a little bored, so vasectomies were apparently free. So um, a couple summers ago, I was on call for um, the weekend of, uh, of uh, July 4th. Okay, so remember July, you know what happens in July. Um, and we had, um, there was a flight that came from South Korea um, into our airport. It was a Boeing 777, and I look every time now when I fly to see what aircraft I have. Um, there were 307 passengers on board, and uh, the, they came in too low and too slow uh, into our, into our seawall, and the plane was crashed. 70 of these uh, were Chinese high school students on their way to a camp in Southern California. And as I mentioned, the plane crashed on its final approach. I'm going to see if I can. I've got to find the little mouse here. Show you the video. Look at him. So some guy was just filming. And you can see the plane coming in. And he just captured this. Look at that one. Look how his nose is up in the air. Oh my God. Oh, it's an accident. Oh, you're filming it too. Oh my God. Oh, oh. No. oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh Lord have mercy. So what happened was they hit the seawall, as you can see here, and the back of the plane fell off. And then it did a pirouette, uh, d dropped the landing gear, and flipped almost uh, 360. Um, it's, it's amazing that anybody survived this. This is what the, what the runway looked like in the bottom right. And on the top, the plane did start on fire. Um, so we were expecting a lot of burns, um, and we got no burns. Uh, everybody, fortunately, was out of the plane. Uh, before the fire started. So there were 100 and, 181 injured passengers. Imagine this. Um, we are the closest um, trauma center to the airport, and we are the designated trauma center for the airport. So we got 10 critical patients uh, at San Francisco General, and two of them went to that other university that's down the ways. We don't say that name. Um, there were two deaths at the scene. Um, one of them was a young girl who was actually run over by one of the fire trucks. She had actually survived being thrown out of the plane. It was very, very sad. Um, and the other one was dead uh, on, on being ejected. Several victims were ejected out the back. Some of them were dragged on the runway, still in their seats, um, out of the back of the plane. Um, and, uh, and, so, and there were nine hospitals that admitted 182 patients. There's a difference between 81 and, and 82 because a person was admitted with chest pain. It's sort of not surprising that somebody would have chest pain after surviving a big crash like this. So this is what the plane looked like at the end. Um, 
some of it's actually held together pretty well. You can see here, I had a number of patients that had sternal fractures and they could tell you that the seats came in to their chest um, and that's how they fractured their sternum. But, but the plane held up pretty well considering what it had gone through. So I was the trauma surgeon on. You can see I had my little um, Balad hat that they made for me when I was down there. And it was a Saturday, and we're on t we take 24 hours in-house call. We had already had two major traumas. We had two in the operating room, and we had finally just finished rounds, and I was enjoying my normal breakfast, which is a power bar and a latte. Seriously, and I got this phone call as I was chomping down on my uh, power bar, and they said, you know, there's a small cargo plane that crashed at the airport, we probably won't get anything. And then I hear the, the uh, emergency uh, sirens and it, it said, uh, we're, we're, the incident command center has been set up. I go, oh, this is not good. And I ran downstairs and there were already people coming in. So we had absolutely no warning about this. And within about 20 minutes, we had 25 ambulances uh, come through our trauma center. So six of them were the most critical, and, and I went down there, there was no triage yet. There was, you know, there's supposed to be somebody triaging patients, and I walked down there, and I saw this, and I, I have to say that I got a little sick to my stomach. I thought, oh my God, I cannot do this. And then I remembered what they did in blood, and I said, okay, so I've got, I looked around at what I have, and I have a senior resident, and I've got some nurse practitioners, and I've got some junior residents, and I said, each of you go in a room, and take that patient and don't think about anybody else. Just go in there and come out and tell me you know, what you've got. And so I had to do that for these first six patients and I remembered the chaos, but it was organized chaos when I had been, seen that and I said, I guess we can do it. We were expecting burns and inhalation injuries. What we got was severe blunt trauma. Well, there were two that were taken to the operating room within minutes. Um, one of them was Dr. Calcutt, who I think was here a couple weeks ago. Um, she was brand new. We had just hired her. She, she heard it on the news and came in. I had one other surgeon who was still in the house doing rounds in the ICU, and I brought him down uh, with me, and that was who we had. Pretty soon, everybody came in. It, there was no phone call triage. Everybody heard about it and came in, which was fortunate for us. Um, these were the first six the most critical, and you can kind of see what their injuries were. We had two that were chance fractures, which are unusual these days, uh, where you have intestine and spine injuries with paralysis. And we had severe, what we thought were road burns, actually, and it turned out that they were road burns from being dragged on the runway, and they were terrible injuries. And you can see where these first six were. This is the chance fracture. Look at this terrible fracture that this uh, person had, usually seen with the lap belt. And you can kind of imagine being strapped on your seat when this plane is doing all this and how these could have ha this could have happened. Um, again, these were usually seen in pediatric patients uh, in the back seat where we didn't have harnesses um, before we had harnesses, and now we're, we saw them with this. And this severe, severe road burn, that was really awful. When you think about what's sitting on the runway as you're being dragged and what gets, got into the skin uh, and deep into the muscle, it was, it was, they were really awful. But we didn't close. Um, you can see on the, on the one side or what we did in that first 48 hours with the crash related, and then we continued to do our regular old emergency stuff that we do all the time um, for those first 48 hours. Uh, it was qu we had five uh, anesthesiologists who came in. We kept all of our, our operating rooms running, um, and we used the tag. And I'm very proud to say that we were very judicious about what, how we um, gave our blood. We used 100 units over 48 hours. Um, and, uh, but we were very careful that we were giving the appropriate ratios so that we weren't wasting any blood. Now this is something that will never happen again. Um, this is four attending radiologists on a Saturday who all came in. And uh, <laughs> we all sat in a little room and uh, after the first wave of, of damage control, and we did a lot of damage control operations that day, uh, we all went back downstairs. And I was sort of, you know, I, I, we had just taken care of six horrible patients. And I went back downstairs, and they said, we've got 37 more. And we sat in a room, and somebody would, would pull up. Now, we gave these patients names. Um, 
Well, and I'll tell you the difficulty we had with uh, being multi multilingual that day, but we had, we gave them names like Disaster, uh, Sacramento, Disaster, you know, a, a California name. If you got Disaster Fresno, you were in bad shape. <laughs> so that, you know, San Diego was a good name to have. So we didn't know who they were. And of course, the first thing they tell you when a plane crashes is get out and leave everything behind, right? So nobody had a passport. Nobody had a name. I mean, so we just gave them names, and somebody would read off the list, and, when, and they said, disaster, San Francisco, and then we go, what, what, who examined the patient, and somebody had, and I said, what, what, uh, what labs do we have? And then somebody had those labs. We were keeping track on paper. Um, and then the radiologists would pull up the films. And so we all sat in a room. We had the chief of neurosurgery, the chief of ortho, the ICU director, and myself, and four attending radiologists go through. And that's how we decided what service they would go to, who needed what. It was quite amazing, actually. And we, we saw a total of 67 patients that day. And you can see many of them were children. We had the pediatricians open up the peds clinic so we could triage some of them uh, there. Now, we did make a few mistakes. Um, we had some patients that had this incredibly weird metabolic picture. They were, had severe acidosis that we could not explain by their injuries. Almost everybody that we checked had calcium levels that were very low, and they, were, they had hypotension and severe arrhythmias, and it, in some of them, it persisted for days. And we couldn't figure this out, and finally somebody said, you know, maybe it's toxic. Maybe they got exposed to something. So we actually talked with the, um, with the, with the Boeing about what's in the plane and, and, the, and the, you know, when the FDA comes out, I mean, when the Federal Bureau comes out to investigate the crash, we talked with them. Nobody could really figure it out. Um, and, you know, there was all this stuff, right? There was a huge amount of stuff out there. And it's like, well, they got exposed to something. And the, it, six months later, and this is again, you know, my military friends chiming in. I'm on a conference call, an international conference call, and somebody's in Afghanistan. And, and we started to talk about this, and he said, we know exactly what it is. It's what comes out of the helicopters when they crash. It's a, it's a, it's a, retard, it's a flame retardant that's made from hydrogen fluoride. And when you think about it, and they, they told us that um, it converts to hydrofluoric acid, and it gives you a devastating inhalation injury if, you, if, if you're uh, in a closed space, but it also binds up your calcium, and it sticks around for a long time, and it gives you these cardiac arrhythmias. And they said in the, once they learned, how to, or learned what it was, if you give nebulized calcium, you could save people. We figured that it was absorbed through the skin of some of these people who had this terrible road burn, and that's why it stayed around for so long. Uh, we just weren't smart enough to do talk screens at the time, and we didn't think about decontamination because you wouldn't think you would need to decontaminate people that were in a plane crash, but, you know, we learned from that. We learned a lot of other things. There were two deaths at the scene, as I told you, and one death in our ICU after several days, and dealing with the grief of people from different countries is very, very difficult. Um, other unique problems were there were children who were traveling alone, there were families that were separated into different hospitals by their acuity, no one had been through customs, um, and Homeland Security had actually set up in our cafeteria, which was quite interesting. And the guy that used to flip burgers for us came in and, and kept the cafeteria open for 24 hours. People from Boston sent pizzas, he says, we know what you're going through. It was a very interesting experience, and none of us left the hospital for days, as you can imagine. And this is something else you don't think about, but the media are very important, especially in an international disaster. They're going to be out there. You're going to have to talk to them. You're going to have to say you can't do anything, say anything that favors one versus the other. So you have to really be well coached. And I, I did my first press conference probably 36 hours after this started, and we were so busy. And um, I had, was a little grisly by 36 hours, as you can imagine. There's international, everyone, CNN, everybody's out there, because it's an international disaster. And you have to be very careful what you say. You can't give away too much. And I was, you know, I was there doing my thing, and, and I thought I was doing okay. And, and there was some guy on the other side, and, and he, his, his question to me was, well, Dr. Knudsen, you know, you've got, you've got these burns, and you've got spinal cord injuries, and when, when are you going to call in the experts? <laughs> and, then, and it was like, my husband was watching on the news. He goes, oh, no, she's going to blow. She's going to really say something horrible. And I, I just looked over at him, and I go, we are the experts. And, 
<laughs> went on from there. So my, my NPs made me a shirt, it says we are the experts. Um, so you have to remember that these things go on for a long time. I don't know if you've had personal experience with disasters, but we had people that we had, I did personally on one patient 25 operations before uh, that patient left the hospital. And we had, it was July. What happens in July? We have brand new interns. This was their first weekend on call. And you know, they were like, is it always like this? I said, no, no, it's, not, it's really not that bad. Um, but it's very important to think about decompressing you know, all of your, uh, your, of your staff. So I've had the very good fortune of, of being offered uh, a part-time position in Chicago to work with the military health system and, and with the American College of Surgeons to see how we can work together. This was, again, the slide that you saw before um, to emphasize that we don't want to lose the advantages that have happened over these last 13 to 15 years. And again, um, Edward Churchill, who was from Harvard at the time, went with World War II, again, warned us that we will learn, you know, that we will um, start the next war um, way back and not where the, this one has left off. So we want to make sure that doesn't happen again. This is from a friend of mine, Jen Gurney, who I met in Lonsdale and who spent last year with me doing research before she was deployed again to Afghanistan. She did a little summary and said, what year of residency were you when you first deployed? And you can see that most people that were first deployed were right out of their residency and had almost no specific pre-deployment training. This is um, from the Army. I think the Air Force does a little bit better with this. But the point is that you're, when, can you imagine coming right out of your surgical residency and being greeted with uh, people that had uh, just been involved, involved in, a, in an IED? I mean, it's really amazing to think that we would send people that weren't quite prepared. And this is another thing that happened. Um, this is uh, data from NISQIP, which is the quality uh, improvement program from the college. And not to mention the names of this is why I kept these kind of small, but many of the military treatment facilities in the states were, you know, did not look so good on NISQIP data. And if you took any hospital, there will be places where they won't be doing so well, infections or central line problems. But because it's military, it became public data, it was published in the New York Times, and they got a lot of flack from this. And then what happens in the interwar periods, um, the Department of Defense is our major funder for trauma research. There's almost no uh, trauma research dollars in NIH. And the CDC, although was very good at funding many of us, and I think you were one here, was one of the CDC centers uh, under Lauren Rue, um, they stopped doing most of that. Uh, and so the major funder remains the Department of Defense for trauma research. And in the interwar period, these funds are at risk to be diverted to um, beneficiary care and uh, breast cancer and some of the other things that are funded by other, um, by other organizations and maybe not, should not be funded by the DOD. That's my personal, um, my personal observation. Now, the college has a huge history uh, with the military, and you can see some of the founding members of the college, they were all in the military. Um, so we've had a long history at, at, in Chicago. This was a, the Great Mace, which comes out during your, your inauguration ceremony. If those of you who are become fellows, you'll go to the, the ceremony at the beginning of the Clinical Congress, and this mace comes out and somebody carries it around. It's a, some type of a instrument that was like a, um, we're, we're on the battlefield at some point, and I don't know what century, but they came from the British. They gave it to the college um, for their help during World War I in, in caring for British soldiers. So da Dr. David Hoyt, uh, you'll recognize, is the executive director of the college, and Dr. Jonathan Woodson is, is the uh, assistant secretary of health for, um, Ass Ass assistant secretary of defense for health affairs, and he's at the DHA. Uh, who, they signed a treaty uh, at the end of October 2014 to work together. And this was our first meeting that we held where we brought in leaders from the military as well as all the branches of the college to help us out in this new um, partnership. And you can see that our group works very closely with uh, many parts of the college as well as the, all the, the uh, pieces of the military to try to bring together what we can do collaboratively. So, so far we've uh, been working on the joint trauma system and we call, we're trying to make sure that it's not uh, pulled apart. Uh, we have a civilian and a military leader uh, of each of these committees. 
and we're trying to put in the Department of Defense's uh, registry into the college's uh, National Trauma Data Bank and then eventually into TQIP, which was the Trauma Quality Assurance Program, and also try to figure out where this trauma system should live in the interwar periods, and we're working on that right now. For education and sustainment, uh, we're developing a course which will, will look at the uh, deployed rural, uh, rural two surgeon. And so we're bringing the rural two surgeons in in May, and they're going to put together a blueprint of what they think a, a surgeon in a far forward base should be able to do um, and how frequently they had to do it so that we can begin to look at how we train people up and make sure that there is a um, unified pre-deployment training that you would have to do before you are sent over, uh, wherever it's going to be. Take, I mean, keeping in mind that we don't know what the next conflict will look like, so we'll have to be nimble and flexible. And tomorrow when I go to the college, I'm interviewing what are called psychometricians, which are people that specialize in making those exams that you have to take uh, and teaching and developing curriculum. And we're hiring our own psychometrician to work on this process. We're also bringing in uh, the, the surgeon champions from the military treatment facilities. There are 30 of them uh, in the states, and we're bringing them into the college in May to take a leadership course in, how, in developing NISQIP uh, for each of these, so there'll be a NISQIP collaborative within the military treatment facilities. Um, and then finally, we're working with uh, Dr. Rasmussen um, to try to f use the National Trauma Data Bank uh, and the DOD Trauma Registry to identify areas where we can work together uh, in the civilian centers to conduct research that's needed. Um, and we, we have been successful. Uh, we were on Capitol Hill last year. Um, Jeff was there with me this year. We campaigned for money to, more money to go into military research. Last year we got $10 million. Uh, this year we asked for 20, and it looks like we've gotten enough signatures that we should be able to get that. And that money will go into Dr. Rasmussen's pocket and then out to the civilian centers uh, for collaborative uh, research on those things that are of interest to the Department of Defense. And finally, we um, resurrected the Excelsior Surgical Society, which it started in Rome uh, in 1945 and was, uh, went into senescence in 1982. Uh, we had our first uh, Excelsior Surgical Society this past year. Um, John Pryor is one of the very few surgeons who actually died. He died in Afghanistan, I believe, in a mortar attack. Um, he was a surgeon uh, at Philadelphia, so every year there'll be a memorial lecture um, for him. Dr. Schwab, who trained uh, Dr. Pryor, gave the first one, and um, Dr. Norman Rich is giving the one this year. And then we used the military um, Region 13 uh, resident paper competition, for those of you that might be involved in that, that we, we hold that together with the Excelsior. So we're excited to have another one this year. We're gonna have a full day's worth and this part, you know, Dr. Woodson um, coaches me on what, what he wants me to say a little bit in, in a good way. And he said, be sure you remind people who are not in the military how this partnership is going to benefit them. He said, just remember what happened in Boston and, and you know, how the civilians were benefited by what the military brought back with us. And I don't know if you know much about uh, Dr. Jacobs and the Hartford con uh, consensus, um, Dr. Jacobs had the opportunity to review the autopsies for the children that were shot and killed at Sandy Hook and recognize that many of them didn't need to die, that they, they didn't have devastating injuries if somebody had gotten to them sooner. Um, so there's a whole movement of trying to train the, the first people there, the teachers, whoever's there, the police, to control bleeding. And it's simple things like combat gauze uh, and tourniquets. Uh, and trying to make them more accessible, at least in the public places. So that's the Hartford Consensus. You'll hear more and more about that. And they, he has this thing called threat, which is once the threat is suppressed, um, the, pers the people who are still in there, you know, because you remember what happened at Sandy Hook is they wouldn't let anybody go in until they were secure. And he said, you know, there were people inside, teachers, people could have done something for these children. So making this available, we'll see how this goes. Many, many police across the country are being trained now. I had one multi, uh, multiple gunshot wound patient at San Francisco General a couple weeks ago. And, he, you know, he was in bad shape when he came in, but he lived. And the, the, the police said, you know, 
we, we put pressure on that wound and we, and we held it till we got here. And I said, well, you saved, you saved us life. So they did learn to do that. This is being co-sponsored by the White House. Um, President Obama has been involved in this, so you'll hear a lot more about this. Um, and it's also important to remind people how much the military has put into simulation. You know, there's all kinds of simulators. Um, these are going to be a tremendous benefit for, to us when we start teaching this course that we're going to develop um, and, and how we're going to train people up to be ready for the next time. Um, <clears throat> and then finally, the NISQIP will hopefully help you know, to change the uh, military treatment facilities, maybe impact the Veterans Association. We haven't quite figured out how that's going to work because it totally, that's not department. Um, it's a little different than the group that we're working with now. It's not DHA, but uh, we, we may see it spill over here. Remember, the NISQIP actually started in the VA. Um, so I think, you know, when you think about it, the military has two, uh, the military surgeons have two roles. They're, they're there to take care of combat casualty cares, but they also take care of the 10 million beneficiaries uh, who have um, access uh, to treatment. So there's a lot um, to be done. Uh, we were presented with this incredible um, display, Dr. Dr. Hoyt and I and Dr. Elster, uh, during the um, Excelsior last year. These were flags that were flown for us in Balad uh, and uh, I think Kandahar, maybe the other one, came from. Um, they came with all their medals and they were put in this beautiful display and we were so pleased. And it now sits on the 28th floor of the American College of Surgeons where it's proudly displayed uh, for everybody that comes through. Um, so that's all I have to say. I really appreciate your attention and I hope that this was what you wanted it to be.